Chapter 34 is all about reflection and refraction. And we're going to discuss it in the terms of something called geometric optics. And in geometric optics, we assume that light is an electromagnetic wave and that light, again, this electromagnetic wave, you can read about this in chapter 33 if you wish, but we assume in geometric optics that light moves in a straight line and that it changes directions when it hits a surface between two media. And we'll discuss what that means, uh, what we mean by this word media. It's basically the interface between two different regions. So let's say I'm shining light from the air into a pool or something. And when I do this, when I shine my light, when my light travels in a straight line and bounces or hits a surface and changes its direction, it does this by either reflecting So this is a wave that bounces back or with refraction. So I can have reflection or refraction. And refraction is when a wave bends. And we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. And something that might come in useful as we're discussing reflection and refraction is this concept of Huygens' construction. Huygens' construction of how light actually works, how a wave works. And what Huygens said was that every point on a wave acts like a source of spherical waves. So this sounds very strange, sounds a little bit abstract, but the way I think of it is, is every point on a wave is like a pebble. So I take a pebble and I drop it into water. When you do that, you see ripples that come out. These ripples come out in big circles. These circles are the spherical waves that are emanating from this central point. So what we do is we imagine that every point on a wave is like this little pebble and it creates a spherical wave that moves outwards away from it, like a dropping a pebble into a pond. So in discussing how light moves in geometric optics, the places that we usually start is, is discussing with reflection. And in particular, we talk about the law of reflection. So let's say I have a medium that separates two surfaces. Maybe I have air up here and I'm bouncing some light off the ground, and the ground is maybe covered with snow. Okay, so I have two different surfaces, and when a light wave comes in, I'm going to draw that like a little arrow, and I'm going to call this a specific name. I'm going to call this an incident wave. So that's the source of my light ray. And what I can do is I can draw a nice perpendicular line separating my my surfaces. Drawing a line perpendicular to the two surfaces and this light is gonna is gonna be absorbed by the ground but some of it is gonna bounce off. And I'm gonna draw that bouncing light bouncing off of whatever surface it hits. And we're gonna call this the reflection wave. Something we should notice is that when I'm drawing the waves in geometric optics, I'm drawing them as, as, as arrows. I don't try to put in the wave-like shape, that just confuses things, but we need to understand that these arrows represent actual light waves. And something I can do here is I can draw the angle B 
between the vertical perpendicular, that red line, and the incident ray. I'm going to call that theta. And then I can draw the angle between the reflected ray and that vertical perpendicular, that red line, and I can call it theta prime. And what the law of reflection tells us is that the angle of incidence, theta, is equal to the angle of reflection, theta prime. Okay? So that is the law of reflection. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Incident angle is equal to reflected angle. And it's all relative to the vertical perpendicular uh, to your two surfaces. So we'll return to discussing reflection a little bit later. But for now, let's move on and talk about what refraction is. And refraction is when light bends. And in essence, this bending is actually the light changing speed. And we know that refraction is light bends when it hits a surface. Okay, and we can calculate what this change in speed is. V, the speed of your light, is going to be equal to the well-known speed of light, C, this is the speed of light in a vacuum, so how fast light is going in a vacuum. Divided by this letter N, where you're here our N is something called the index of refraction. And here we see that refraction uh, word coming up again. Our n varies. For a vacuum, it's equal to 1. And otherwise, the n is always going to be greater than 1. We can draw a picture to describe this refraction. I'm going to assume that I have two surfaces. I'm going to call this surface 1, and I'm going to call this surface 2. It could be any two things. Uh, well, for, for the purposes of this example, we'll say we're, we have some air up here, and we have some water down here. And I'm going to shine a ray of light. I'm going to have my ray come in and hit my surface. That's going to be my incident ray, the light that comes in. And just like we did with reflection, we're going to draw this perpendicular line in. Line perpendicular to the two surface, to the interface between the two surfaces. And I can draw my initial angle here, the angle of incidence. And then I know that some of this light is going to be reflected. So I'm going to draw that reflected light in. Draw it, draw it in in blue. That's my reflected light ray. We just learned about this. We know that this angle that I reflect at, relative to my perpendicular, is going to be theta prime. And we know from the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection, the law of reflection, that theta is equal to theta prime. But if we've ever seen this happen before, uh, let's say I'm inside of a pool underneath this water, I can actually see this light ray that's coming in. So not all the light is reflected away. Some of it gets down into the pool, and it actually gets bent a little bit. So we're going to have this third ray 
and we're going to call that the refracted ray. And we'll call this theta 2. And maybe to help us out a little bit, we can, we can call this incident angle theta 1. So that would be theta 1 as well. So I can figure out how all these things are related, how theta 1 relates to theta 2. And the amount of refraction that you get, how much this light ray bends when it enters into your little second medium, depends on the law of refraction, which tells us that N1 times sine of theta 1, so that's going to be the index of refraction up here in the first surface that you're traveling through, times the sine of this incident angle, is going to be equal to n2 times sine of theta 2, where n2 is the index of refraction in my second surface. And sine theta 2 is my refracted angle. You can read all about all these things a little bit more on page 1120 and 1121 of your book. And I suggest looking at example three and four and figure number 34.2 as you're studying to figure out this equation here, the law of refraction. Now there's a very special case of refraction that we can get where I have two surfaces one with N1, one with N2, and I have a light ray that comes in and it hits my surface. I can draw my perpendicular in and I have my incident angle. I'm going to call this theta C. And if theta C is set up just right, then the refracted ray won't actually be refracted at all. There will be no refraction and all my light will be reflected but it'll be reflected parallel to my surface. So my reflected ray is completely parallel to whatever surface I'm on. It's along that surface. So there's no refraction. And it turns out that, that I can get this situation, which is called total internal reflection. And I can get this situation depending entirely on the angle of incidence, this angle right here, where which I've labeled theta C, and it also depends on these indices of refraction. It turns out that sine of theta c is equal to the index of refraction in the surface you're hitting divided by the index of refraction of the surface you're coming from. So in this case, you get total internal reflection, where the whole ray is reflected and there's no refraction. we actually give the angle that gives us this a special name. We call this theta c the critical angle. Any angle above this critical angle will give us total internal reflection and we won't have any reflected, refracted light. So this is a good equation to keep in mind. This is very useful in medicine, in medical fields, uh, with doing laparoscopic surgeries, and, and in the field called fiber optics, which some of you might, might use in, in your future careers. And something interesting happens with this index of refraction. 
We know that it's n, n tells us the index of refraction of a surface. We can look up these numbers, but something that makes it a little bit more difficult is that different colors actually refract differently. So the index of refraction of a color is, is specific to, to that color. The index of refraction of a surface, rather, is, is specific to the actual color that you get. The index of refraction is going to increase. So you're going to bend light more as wavelength actually decreases. So different colors refract actually different amounts. If you know the, the famous guy Roy G. Biv. This is a mnemonic device that you usually learn in elementary school to describe all the different colors of the rainbow. You have your reds, your orange, your yellow, all the way down to your kind of violet colors. And in this spectrum, what we notice is that violet has the lowest wavelength. Since it has the lowest wavelength, that means it has the highest index of refraction of all the colors. Conversely, red has the highest wavelength. So it has the lowest index of refraction. You see this every day when you're looking at sunsets. You see something similar. Sunsets look red because the red light is bent the least, because it has the highest wavelength and the lowest index of refraction. And this, this process of different colors refracting differently has a different name. So different color refraction call it colored refraction has a specific name something you've probably heard of and you can see when you shine light into a prism it's called dispersion maybe we'll have time to work with this a little bit in your in your labs so as we keep moving forward in the field of geometric optics we come to something called a ray diagram and these allow us to show how light is going to react to mirrors and to lenses. And we'll take first an example of a mirror, and we're going to use something called a concave mirror. So to draw mirrors and to draw ray diagrams, which we're going to do a lot of, we first draw a little middle line. This little line in the middle has a specific name. It's something called the optical axis. This optical axis acts as the middle point for, say, a mirror that I can then draw. And I'm drawing a concave mirror, which means it kind of caves in. And I can imagine what happens if this was a full circle, if this is just an arc that I can complete and maybe draw a full and complete circle. My circle drawing skills aren't great, but imagine that's your full circle. And then we can go to the very middle point on this circle. And I can mark this point C, and C has a specific name. It stands for the center of curvature. So it's the center of a complete circle that you could draw out of your, your spherical mirror. So let's see what happens when a light ray actually comes in. I can have a light ray. It's going to come in and hit my mirror. It's going to bounce off of this mirror, and it's going to obey the law of reflection and refraction, ref, uh, the law of reflection, and it's going to bounce through and give me a reflected ray. And I'm going to have another ray down here that comes in, and it's going to bounce through and have a reflected ray. I can figure out what those angles are. I know what they're going to be. 
I can draw a perpendicular line perpendicular to my uh, surface wherever I strike it. I know that this angle here, the angle of incidence, is going to be equal to the angle of reflection. So these are the same angle. I can draw my perpendicular down at the bottom part where my ray strikes. My perpendicular, I know that this angle theta, the angle that I reflect off of, is equal to the angle that I'm incident at. And these two rays, they converge. They meet at a certain point. This certain point has a specific name. We call this the focal point. You can label it with a capital F, where F is going to be the focal point. And that's where all the light from this mirror is going to be reflected to. It's going to focus at a specific point. And it turns out, for a mirror, this focal point has a very specific definition. <laughs> And this definition is based on the length from the mirror to the focal point. So let me label that. I'll kind of draw it in here. Distance from my focal point to the mirror itself. We'll label this with a little f. And this little f is called the focal length. That's the distance from my mirror to the point where all my light gets focused. And it's related to the geometry of whatever mirror you have. If we look closely, we can, we can kind of approximate, approximately draw to scale what, what we're seeing. I can go from the edge of my mirror to the center of my mirror to the center of curvature. So since this is a circle, uh, this, is, this is basically one half the diameter. So we have that name for that, that's called a radius. So the focal length, if we draw everything to scale, will turn out to be one half of the radius of whatever your mirror size is. So to summarize, the center of curvature defines the point where the center of your mirror would, would be if it were a whole circle. The focal length tells you where all the light would focus. Then we also have these other terms. The F, lowercase f, stands for focal length. This is the distance from your mirror to where all the light is focused, to your focal point. And then we have uh, the focal length is equal to 1 half r, where r is the radius of curvature. So that's the distance from your mirror to your center of curvature. And one final thing to take note of. If I look at this picture, all my light rays, they're all converging on the front side of this mirror. So that means that my image is going to form at the front of the mirror, in front of where the mirror actually is. All the light is reflecting off of this mirror to give me a picture right in front. It's focusing the light in front. I would expect that a mirror would reflect all the light to be in front of it. So since I'm getting what I expect for the front side of a mirror, the image that I'm getting is actually something called a real image. So if I'm at the front of a mirror, and my light rays that I drew are actually meeting each other in front of the mirror, I call that a real image. And I expect a real image because light should reflect off of a mirror. It should be in the front. The light should meet in the front of the mirror. So it is a real image. So we can draw a similar example with, say, a convex mirror. And we'll want to start off this ray diagram with this middle line that was called the optical axis, except now I have a convex mirror. So my light ray is going to come in and it's going to bounce off. And I can figure out where it's going to bounce off based on still the center of curvature and, and figuring out the focal points. The focal point, we just figured out the focal length is one half of the radius. So if I can imagine extending out this little circle, if this were a full circle, I can find the center of this circle, that's my 
center of curvature, and my radius is going to uh, be from my mirror to my center of curvature, and my focal point is going to be based on the focal length, which is going to be one half of the radius. So my focal length is one half of my radius, and I'm trying to approximately draw these to scale. And that allows me to find where my focal point is. And that focal point is where all the light is going to focus. Now, what we saw here was the light that came in, the little light ray coming in and reflecting off. And then I have another light ray that comes in from the bottom, and it's going to reflect off. And if I look at these two rays, the one up top and the one down bottom, these two are never going to meet. If my light rays never meet, my light never focuses, and I would never see anything. But what I can do is I can imagine that these reflected rays, they kind of extend back behind the mirror. I can imagine seeing something that looks like it's behind this mirror. So these light rays that reflect actually bounce backwards. They project themselves backwards into the mirror, and they meet at that focal point. So what I have happening here is my light rays, they never actually meet in front of the mirror. They are actually getting little rays that look like they're meeting behind the mirror. So if I'm on the back side of a mirror, then the image I'm getting isn't where I expect. The light rays aren't reflecting off the front and focusing at the front. They're on the back. So if I'm on the back side of a mirror, my image is something called virtual. And this affects what I get for my focal length. My focal length is no longer focusing light in front of the mirror where I want it to, where I would expect it to. So my focal length is now going to be equal to negative one half of R. And this is specific to mirrors themselves. These, this information won't necessarily apply to lenses, but what we need to do to keep things straight, at least how I keep things straight, is to think about where images should and should not be. For a mirror, I expect things to be in front. Anything that's in front of a mirror, therefore, is going to be positive, and it's going to be real things for me. I don't expect things on the back side of the mirror. Since I don't expect things, don't expect light to actually meet back there and we can see in this picture that it doesn't I had to draw these little dotted lines these these virtual extensions of my reflected rays to get light to meet anything that's on the back side of the mirror specifically the focal length is going to turn out to be negative and I will have a virtual image on the back side of that mirror So we can solve lots and lots of mirror problems, lots of mirror diagrams, ray diagram pictures, using the following mirror images guide. This tells you all the different rays to trace to find where images are going to form for mirrors. The first ray is through the center of curvature and right back on itself. Second ray is parallel to the optical axis and reflects through the focal point. Third ray is through the focal point and reflects back parallel. And final fourth ray hits at the op optical axis. And we recognize that theta incident is equal to theta reflected. Angle of incidence is angle of reflection. So let's see an example of how this ray diagram can be drawn. So we're first going to draw an optical axis. That's my central line that goes down the middle. And I'm going to actually draw a concave mirror. And let's say that my center of curvature is going to be right here. So there's my C. And that lets me find what my F is. My focal point is going to be half of that C. Focal length is half of the radius, so the focal point is half of the center of curvature. 
and now I can start drawing some of these rays. Let's imagine that I'm trying to form an image of this little arrow right here. This little arrow kind of stands up, and all my light is coming from this. I can draw four different rays to figure out where my image will be, where the reflected picture of this little arrow will appear. The first rule is to draw through the center of curvature and back on itself. So I'm going to have a little piece of light that comes down through the center of curvature and it's going to bounce back and go right along that same path. So I'm, I'm kind of embellishing how much this, this actually moves away from it. It actually bounces back right along the same path. And that's my first ray. Completely done. Piece of cake. My second light ray, we'll draw that in blue, is going to start at the top of this arrow, let's say. This is the point where all my light rays are coming from. And I'm going to go parallel to the optical axis. So that's parallel to that middle line. And I'm going to hit my mirror. When I hit my mirror, uh, my step, my little guide, tells me that I reflect through my focal point. So I'm going to reflect through this focal point. And that is going to be my second ray. Something we can do if we're not sure, it looks to me like our image is going to form on the front side of my mirror, uh, but if we're not sure, all these reflected rays, we can imagine little dotted lines extending backwards behind the mirror. No light actually reflects back here, but it can look like it does. You can always draw the reflected extensions as, as, I like to draw them as dotted lines behind the mirror. My next ray, my third one, is through the focal point and reflects back parallel to the optical axis. So I start right here up at the top of my arrow and I'm going to go through my focal point. And then I hit my mirror and I'm going to reflect back parallel to the optical axis. And this is a good point a good place to point out that any of the virtual little dotted lines that you draw are based on extending backwards whatever your reflected ray is. So the reflected ray was parallel for this third uh, little rule. So my reflected ray is likewise parallel. And then finally we have step number four. Step number four is a light ray comes in and it hits the center of this mirror. And it's going to reflect so that the angle of incidence, the angle that I hit with, is equal to the angle of reflection. So these two angles, even though it doesn't look quite like I've drawn it uh, quite that well, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And something we can notice is that all of these lines, if you use a ruler to draw these, this will actually happen. All of these lines meet at one point. I can draw a little arrow at that point. That little arrow represents the image that is formed by my reflected rays. This is my image from this mirror. This image that I formed, since it's on the front side of a mirror, and since all the little rays that I see are all solid lines, the way that I draw it, that means that this is a real image. I'm at the front of the mirror where I expect my light rays to all converge, so it's going to be a real image. And we also see it's upside down, so we're going to call this an inverted image. So the light rays I've met in such a way so that I formed a real inverted image with this mirror. So that is for a concave mirror. If you'd like to see a convex mirror, then uh, practice it yourself or send me questions and I'm happy to do an example in class. So you don't so just solve these kinds of problems using, um, using ray diagrams. We can also use algebra when working with mirrors. If we're using algebra to work with our mirrors, then we want to use something called the mirror equation. The mirror equation tells us that 1 divided by s plus 1 divided by s prime is equal to 1 divided by f, where s is the distance from whatever object you're making an image of to the mirror. 
S prime is the distance from the image to the mirror. And F is the focal point of your mirror, the focal length. And some sign conventions to keep in mind is these numbers are going to be positive if in front of the mirror and they will be negative if you're behind the mirror. To get some practice with this, you can take a closer look at problem solving techniques on page number 1134 and you can try checkup number 34.4. So in geometric optics, we don't just work with mirrors, we also work a good bit with lenses. And we have two types. We don't call them concave and convex like we do in mirrors. We call them converging and diverging mirror, uh, lenses. So when we're working with lenses, there's a few equations we can use algebraically to handle them. Uh, we have the lens ma maker's formula, which tells us that 1 divided by the focal length of a lens, where a lens will focus all of our light, is equal to n minus 1 where n is the index of refraction of whatever your lens is made out of, times 1 divided by r1 plus 1 divided by r2. So all these variables mean something, specifically the r's. The n is the index of refraction. We've worked with this a little bit. We already know what index of refractions are. Uh, this is something that you'd likely look up in a book to find out what the index of refraction of your material is. R1 and R2 are the radii of curvature of your lens surfaces. So what does that mean? So if we draw a lens, I'm going to draw a converging lens. And each side of this lens can have a different radius of curvature. The front side could be R1, and the back side could have a slightly different radius. We'd call that R2. So these are the two different radii, because lenses have two surfaces. They have a front side, R1, and a back side, R2. So the light is actually refracting through this and hits both of these surfaces, both this R1 and R2. So we have to factor that in in the lens maker's formula. This is very useful in practical aspects and practical as applications, and it's used a lot for telescopes. But there's a more commonly used equation. We call it the thin lens equation. So the thin lens equation is going to look very, very uh, familiar. The thin lens equation tells us 1 divided by s plus 1 divided by s prime is equal to 1 divided by f where 1 over s uh, is the object distance, or rather the s in 1 over s is the object distance. s prime is the image distance, and f is your focal length. Lenses get maybe a little bit more complicated than mirrors. There are sign conventions that you have to follow. To, so to know what sign conventions, convention to follow, you can look this up in figure number 34.48, where they summarize it. I'll talk a little bit about it when I do some examples in a moment. And you can look at problem-solving techniques on page 1138. So we have sign convections and ray diagrams that we can also draw for thin lenses. These are found on page 1137. You can read about them there. I've summarized them. The first ray that we can draw is parallel, and then it goes through the second focal point. Second, 
we have through the center of the lens and reflects back on itself. And finally, we have through a first focal point and then refracting back parallel. So what does this look like and how do we actually use this? So let's draw a ray diagram for a lens. First, I'm going to draw my optical axis. Optical axis still exists, that's my central line. I'm gonna draw a lens that makes light converge. We call this a converging lens. So I draw the little lens-like shape. It actually looks like a, a little lens. What we need to notice is I have two surfaces that I come off of for a lens. I have the front surface and I have the back surface. Because of this, I actually have two focal points. So I have a focal point up front uh, and I have a focal point in the back. Focal point one and focal point two. And I can start drawing in what my ray diagram looks like to see how this lens actually creates an image. So let me draw my little arrow shape that's gonna represent my object. I can label the distance of that object. That distance is gonna be from the middle of my lens to the object itself. And we would label that an S. Okay, and just so this doesn't get too busy, I'm going to go ahead and erase that little picture so that, so that we don't get confused with, with all the rays that we're going to be drawing. So the first ray that we draw involves light coming in parallel. So my light is going to come in parallel, and it's going to hit this lens. And something that helps some people might help you if you wish you can draw a nice little dotted line down the center of this lens. This shows you where the center of the lens is, gives you a point to, 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 to hit for, for drawing your rays. So when I draw my first ray diagram, if you, if you uh, look on the rules for, on page 1137 for drawing ray diagrams for lenses, the first ray comes in parallel and it's going to refract, it's going to bend and go through my second focal point. So my light's going through my second focal point. Okay, kind of tried to draw as straight of a line as I could. I didn't just succeed very well, but, but we're getting the right idea. And while I've drawn this, I want to think about what kinds of things I have, what kinds of pictures I'm going to have, and what kind of rays I'm going to be drawing. So kind of on the left-hand side of the lens, I don't really expect a lens to focus light on the same side as that lens. I would expect it to focus light on the opposite side. If you imagine like a magnifying glass trying to focus light, it focuses on the opposite side of the lens. So I'm gonna make all these rays coming in from the front side, I'm gonna make these dotted lines. Because in general, when we're talking about images, the left-hand side, of the lens for an image will be virtual and the back side of the lens will be real. So we can use dotted and solid lines. Again, that's not something you have to do. That's just something I like to do. It helps me to see what's going on. Our second ray is going to go through the center of our lens. So I can draw that as well as I can. I'm going to go through the center of my lens and it's just going to keep on going. Okay, so we have our first ray that came in parallel and refracted through our focal point. We have our second ray that goes straight through the center of our lens. And then our third ray is going to go through our first focal point, hit the center of our lens, and then it's going to come out, refract out parallel and keep going. So that is going to be our third little ray. And what we can notice is they all meet up, even with my crappy drawing. You'll need to use a ruler to get these to actually match up, to get them drawn well. But I can draw my little arrow of my image. And I see my image is on the opposite side of the lens where I expect my image to be. So this is gonna be a real image and it's gonna be inverted. Now, it does bear mentioning that lenses have a little bit more complicated um, sign conventions. 
So, so we'll, we'll re I'll repeat them here, uh, even though you can read about them extensively in your book. So if my object, if S, is in front of my lens, that's where I expect it to be. I expect an object to be in front of my lens, so I'm going to get a positive S, a positive object distance. If I'm behind my lens for some reason, this can happen with a multiple lens system. My object can be behind the lens that I'm working with. I can actually get a negative object distance. Then if we talk about S prime, the object di or the image distance, if S prime is in front of lens, I don't expect a lens to focus all of its light in front of the lens to, to make an image in front of it. I expect that from a mirror, I don't expect that from a lens. So I'm going to get a negative image distance. If I'm behind that uh, lens where I expect to be, then I'm going to get a positive image distance. And anytime I have a negative image distance, that's going to be a virtual image. The light rays are not actually going to meet. Anytime I'm behind the lens where I expect my light to focus, that's going to be a real image. And finally, I mentioned we have two different types of lenses. If my lens is converging, so if it makes light converge together, if my light is, lens is converging, then my focal length, F, is going to be positive. Conversely, if my lens is diverging, if it makes light rays go away from each other, then my focal length is going to be negative. And let's see an example of that, a right ray diagram with a diverging lens. As we've done before, we will draw an optical axis. I'll draw a diverging lens, so it kind of looks a little bit differently. It doesn't bow out, it bows in. And there's my diverging lens. I'm going to draw my object. And then I'm going to obey, uh, I'm going to draw my focal lengths, my focal points. I have one in the front, I have one in the back. Okay, so we can go through my object distance S is in front of the lens, so S is going to be a positive number. If I wanted to plug it into the lens make uh, the thin lens equation, 1 over S plus 1 over S prime equal to 1 over F. It's a diverging lens, so my F is going to be negative. So let's find what S prime would be by drawing a ray diagram. And something that's a little bit tricky with these is that my focal points, they, they, they kind of switch with the way that I've, that I've given you your rules. So now for a diverging lens, F2 is in front and F1 is behind. So let's draw these, these rules. Let's follow these rules for drawing all of my rays. My first ray comes parallel and then goes through the second focal point. So I'm going to go parallel. I'm going to hit the center of my lens, and then I'm going to go through the second focal point. But this is a diverging lens. It actually doesn't make the light da converge to the second focal point. It actually makes the light go away. So by diverging, it shoots the light away. It kind of makes the light spread out. How do I know that it goes at this particular angle? Well, I need to imagine that I draw this line backwards, have these dotted rays going through my second focal point. Okay, so my next ray is the easy one. It goes through the center of the lens. So that one shouldn't be a problem to draw. I come in and I'm going through the center of the lens. And I just keep going. And just to be uh, consistent, we'll make sure that anything 
on the left hand side of my lens is a dotted line anything on the right hand side is a positive line and remember that's just something I do something I draw to, to help it make more sense for me you do absolutely do not have to draw those those dotted lines and next we have the final part where we go through the first focal point and then we come out parallel so my first focal point is all the way over here so I need to draw a line that's aiming towards going to that focal point. So I'm going towards my focal point, and then I hit the lens. At this point, the converging lens is going to make the light refract, and it's going to come out parallel. Okay? So I can see that none of these rays that are on the right-hand side, this first ray, second ray, or third ray, are going to intersect. But what I can see is that when I extend this parallel ray backwards to behind the lens, where I don't expect the light to be focused, I get all three of these intersecting. So they all intersect there, and they form an image at this point. So my image now, S prime, is formed in front of the lens. I don't expect that to be the case. I don't expect that a lens would focus all of its light in front of it. That seems uh, non-intuitive to me. So that tells me that this is going to be a negative image distance. If that makes no sense to you, uh, then your best approach, I suggest, is going to be to just memorize those sign conventions. If you can't make intuitive sense out of it, then, then, then memorization is the way to go. And something to notice here is that my object has a certain height. We'll call that the height of the object. And my image also has a certain height, height of the image. And it's changed. My image has shrunk. And we describe this with something called magnification. Magnification tells me how big my image is going to get when it shines through a mirror or through a lens. That's usually uh, one of the big purposes of these things, is to make images look bigger or smaller. Uh, this is what microscopes and, and telescopes use. So, so you should uh, really know how to use this magnification, especially if you're going to go into the labs to work. So magnification, even biology labs. So magnification M is going to be equal to negative S prime, the image distance, divided by S, the object distance. And what we know is that if M is positive, then your image is upright. And if M is negative, then the image is inverted. So a negative magnification doesn't mean that your object is, is actually ends up being smaller. A negative magnification just tells you whether it's upright or inverted, and to be clear, that's uh, relative to this optical axis. So if I draw two optical axes, an arrow that's pointing straight up, that's going to be a positive magnification because it's uh, above the optical axis. And if my arrow ends up pointing down so that my image is pointing down, that's going to be inverted. That's going to be a negative magnification. And that is chapter number 34.